Hey guys, welcome to Ready to Scale. I'm Ellie Perlman, your host broadcasting from sunny California. When I'm not behind the mic, I buy multifamily properties with passive investors who partner with me on my deals. So Ready to Scale is our new second season here where we focus on the business side of real estate, namely three key concepts that I like to call APS of real estate, asset, process, and strategy. By listening in, you will learn valuable business principles to help your real estate business, whatever it may be, thrive and diversify. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. And if you enjoy it, please take a minute and rate us. It means a lot to me and my team. All right. So our guest today is Mark Owens, who is living the dream. Mark spent three years in the rat race as an IT professional and woke up one day and thought there must be a better way. He bought his first rental property and realized that it was his ticket to working smarter, not harder. 17 years later, Mark owns a portfolio of over 100 rental units and coaches new investors to acquire and build their portfolios as well. As an investor and entrepreneur, Mark has wisely expanded out his business to include connecting hard money lending through his most recent company, hardmoneychoices.com. In addition, he is a private aircraft pilot and a rescue and advanced open water diver. That's an interesting bio, Mark. Hey, welcome to the show. <laughs> hey, thanks, Ellie. I really appreciate you taking the time to have me on and, and give us both an opportunity to provide so much value to so many people in such an easy format. I mean, this is, like, this is the best. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So before we get, you know, we start talking about real estate, you're a pilot and a diver. Yeah, you know, sometimes people just have too much free time and they need to find things to fill it with. Um, <laughs> I mean, well, I've, that's I've been, good. Yeah, I, was, I got my scuba diving certification before I got into rentals, but, you know, it was a few years ago, maybe six or seven years ago, I was just, I was sitting around my house, kind of bored because I really don't have to work that much and most of my friends still do and I think I like I went to Google and I just typed in something like stuff to do I might not have wrote the word stuff it might have been something else but I wrote stuff to do and I think like you know learn how to fly a plane came up and I thought yeah I'll do that and it'll keep me, it'll keep me busy for a while and I started taking my flying you know my private pilot's license lessons and mm-hmm. uh, a year later I was a private pilot it was never like a dream or anything it was really just something to do because I was so damn bored and you were bored because how, how did you have so much free time? Because I built up uh, a, an amazing rental portfolio and I put systems in place where I typically work an hour or two a day on my rentals on average. Some days I don't do anything and, and then I might hustle for four or five hours, but it's typically an hour or two a day. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's the way things worked out for me. Interesting. I definitely want to talk about that. Uh, so before we start talking about the assets and then move to process and strategy, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you got started in real estate? Sure. I was uh, back in 2000, you know, 19, maybe 1998 to 2002, I was in the computer business and I was making really good money. And I was investing in the stock market because I didn't know any better. I just thought that's what people do. And uh, <laughs> And I was, you know, I was doing it like the lazy way, investing in mutual funds and stuff like that. And, and that we had this dot com crash, and I'd lost everything that I'd made. I didn't, I didn't lose the money I put in, but I lost everything that I had made. And I hurried up and I pulled it out. And it was, I think it was like maybe one hundred and thirty thousand that I'd saved up for over a few years. And I just thought, well, I want to invest this, but I, I really don't know what to do. But the stock market's more like a casino than anything. The only people that make any money in the stock market usually are the people that are like, you know, the sales guys that are doing the trades for you. And, uh, and so I used to actually work when I was in the IT field, I worked at, I don't want to mention the name of the company, but I worked for one of their brokerage houses and I saw the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And it just kind of made me sick where you know, the broker will, they'll pull up this database and they'll go through looking for people that they haven't talked to for six months that have $50,000 invested that they haven't traded. And then they'll go through this list and they'll read the notes that they have in there. And then they'll call you up and they'll say, Hey, Ellie, this is Mark over at blankety blank. Yeah. I was just, you know, sitting down in my office looking at your portfolio and I see that you're really heavy in IBM. And I think that this would be a really good time to, you know, sell that and pick up Cisco. And by the way, how's your, how's your daughter doing? Last time we talked, you know, she was getting ready to get her, you know, something. 
And so you're sitting there at home thinking, man, this guy, he knows my daughter. He's, you know, he remembers, you know, that she had this place he was in. And you're thinking all that. And all that they're doing is just reading from their notes. And then they'll ask you a couple of questions. When they hang up, they type in, yeah, Ellie's about to enter the seventh grade and blah, blah, blah. And then when they call you back six months later to get you to buy or sell something, they're reading those notes again. And they're just creating this fake relationship in order to make a commission off of you. And when I saw all that, and I was losing, you know, I lost what I'd made in the stock market. I just thought there's got to be a better way. There just, there's got to be something. And maybe 10 years earlier, I'd had like a desire to house hack. It wasn't called that back then, but I wanted to buy like a two family building, live in one, rent the other. And I thought at the time when I wasn't making that much money, that that would be like part of my wealth building process. Like that would be to help to get me out of the middle class, which is where at that time, that's what I thought I was. I thought I was going to be stuck in the middle of class for the rest of my life. That's where I grew up. And that's just what I thought it would be like. And, uh, I bought my first rental unit. You know, I, I, it was 2001 that I started reading books about it. And, you know, I put together a spreadsheet that would calculate my cash on cash return on investment. And I, I was looking for a 30% return. And I, most people think that sounds crazy or ridiculous. I live in Baltimore. This is like the cash flow capital of the planet. If you can't do it here, you can't do it anywhere. And uh, after a few months, I found my first building and I bought it. And then, you know, probably within a month, I bought another one. And within a month, I bought another one. And uh, back then, this was 2002, man. There was no Google. There was no bigger pockets. Nobody ever heard of a podcast. And somebody would probably slap you if you said podcast back then because they wouldn't have any idea what you're talking about. Uh, there were no meetups or RIAs or any of that stuff. So I just like, I was really kind of like just trying to figure it out. But I had a, I had a goal. And my goal at the time was I want to buy enough rentals where if something happens to me, it, because I was a contract trainer, which meant, you know, if I got sick, got a car accident, something happens, like there's no income. And my wife wasn't working. She, we just had a, a son was born in 1999. She wanted to stay at home with him for a couple of years. And then she wanted to go back to school. So it's like a five-year period where I was the breadwinner. And the rentals to me seemed like, man, if I get enough of them, like 10, 15, and they're making two, $300 a month, if I get hit by a car, at least we have enough money coming in to just cover our, like our bare living expenses. Might have to cancel cable, might have to throw my pager out. I, don't, I didn't have a cell phone back then. And uh, it started as that. It was just a way to cover myself in the event that I couldn't work. And then as I began to learn the business, you know, like I had this artificial cap on myself where it's like, you know, the most you can do is 10 or 15. Like I'd never met anybody that owned 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 500 units. I'd never met those people. And as my career began to progress and I started to meet other people that owned 15 houses, 20 houses, 25 mm -hmm. houses, I thought, well, why stop? I mean, first off, I love it. I love buying a house. My tenants paying for the house. They're paying for my car. They're now they're paying for my house. Like I love this. And back then I had to do it. You had to put 10% down and pay your closing costs. That's before I heard of hard money. I never, you know, when I first heard of hard money, I thought it didn't even sound legal. You know, twelve percent and three points. God, that is hard. You know, and uh, but once I just started to discover these tools that were out there through like networking and talking to people and going to different events, and it, it just it opened up a whole new world of possibilities for me. Where I, I learned that literally there is no limit to how far you can go. Most of us, the limits that most of us have are self-imposed. You know, mm -hmm. we are our own worst enemies in many cases. Whether it's diet or exercise or growing your business or your wealth or whatever. We think of every excuse in the world why it won't work, or we just set these artificial limits like, okay, well, you know, I can lose 10 pounds. Well, you can actually lose 20 pounds if you want. You don't have to stop at 10. You don't have to stop at 10 houses. You can buy 20 or 50 or 100. Like there's, there's no limit to that other than, you know, most of the time our desire. And so that, that's kind of like the brief rundown. I'm sorry. I could go on and talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> no, no, that. That, that, that's really interesting. Uh, I mean, you, you lived in, um, you know, you were making good money. And basically the, the idea that the understanding that tomorrow this check that is coming, it's very nice check, can stop. And then what do I do? Exactly. That, that, was, the, that was the thing that got me into the cash flowing rentals. That was the goal. Mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting. And so you make, you make that realization and then you decide to start buying single family homes. 
Yeah, I was looking for single families. The first property that I bought was actually three apartments and it had a really large garage in the back that rented out for two fifty a month to a, uh, HVAC guy that used it to make his duct work and stuff like that. So it was three apartments, three one bedroom apartments in the garage. And I bought that for 75,000 wow. in 2002. And the total rent back then was about maybe fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars $1,600 a month. Wow. <laughs> yep. Very nice. Do you still own this place? I, you know, that was 2002. I think I sold it around 2005, 2006. And uh, I sold it for it's either 180 or 185,000. And I put very little work into it, maybe 10,000 at the most. So I made a, a bunch of money off of it. And then I took that money and I went and I bought more rentals. I didn't go buy a big house or an expensive car or any of that stuff. I just invest, reinvested my money into my business. Interesting. And so I want to go back to to that moment where you're realizing that you need a, a sustainable, steady income besides your W-2 job. Um, what brought you to single family homes versus, you know, buying a shop for instance, or doing an Airbnb or anything else? Yeah. Well, first there was no Airbnb. <laughs> there was no Uber. There was none of that. Uh, it was really, you know, houses are something I understand. I live in one, I've rented apartments, I've rented houses, like I get that. And it was, it was very easy for me to figure out, you know, how much is a house going to rent for in this neighborhood? Or what would an apartment rent for? It was very easy. With a commercial and retail and office space, it's a lot more difficult. And also, you know, I was, I like to say I was smart enough to figure this out. I really wasn't, but it's like with the residential, no matter what the economy is doing, people always need a place to live. And you see what Amazon's doing to the malls and the shopping centers. And, you know, the, when the economy starts to turn, you know, you'll see all these for rent signs and office space. And, you know, you go to Main Street, America, any small town, and, you know, they're, they're ghost towns now. So I just figured for myself that Class C neighborhoods, working class neighborhoods were pretty much recession proof. And uh, 2007, 2008, 2009, I found out how, how right I was because when – you know, I had friends that had commercial stuff and in office space and, and stuff in class A neighborhoods. Their rents started to go down and their vacancies increased and my rents went up. And uh, mm. I don't, you know, I assume the same thing's going to happen in the next market turn, which could be next week or it might not be for a few years. We don't know that, but I know that the properties that I invest in are pretty much recession proof. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that's very interesting. What do you think uh, C neighborhoods are recession proof? What's, what's, special about the type of neighborhoods that your friends that own nice, you know, apartments and have to deal with, you know, higher vacancies and, and lower um, rates, rental rates. Man, this is, that's a great question. And uh, some of your, some of the listeners might not like it. We'll let history be the judge of what I say is right or wrong. I know that the last time this happened, I was right. Uh, I used to argue with some friends about this in 2006, 2007, and they're out of business now. And, and the three people specifically that I'm talking about actually moved out of Maryland. Their stuff went so bad, they, they left the state. Uh, right now, the economy is kind of showing some signs of slowing down. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. Maybe sometimes the media makes more news than they report. But mm -hmm. right now, it seems like the, you know, the economy may be slowing down a little bit. And some of my friends that rent stuff in any neighborhoods, they're having to offer, you know, reduce the rents a couple hundred dollars a month. Their vacancies are lasting longer. Here's what happens. This is from my experience, the way it looks. And this is what happened last time. When the economy turns and everyone thinks, okay, we're going into recession. The first thing people do is hold their money back. They don't want to spend so much money because they don't know what's going to happen. So they want to look for a cheaper place to rent. You know, they want to spend less money on a car instead of getting a $60,000 car, maybe they'll get the $40,000 car. So they start to hold their money back. A lot of people move out of the A neighborhoods down to the B neighborhoods because either they're losing their jobs or their, their pay is getting cut if they're commission based, maybe they're making less money. The same thing happens in the B neighborhoods. A lot of those people you know, like the upper middle class are going through the same thing that the A neighborhoods are where they're, you know, they're starting to think, man, I don't know about my job. I don't know about this. You know, I don't want to spend so much money on these. So they want to cut their expenses. So they move to lower price neighborhoods. Well, the people in the C neighborhoods really don't have much further to go. You can go to the D neighborhoods where, you know, a lot of the houses are boarded up and there's drug activity in the street and stuff like that. The people in the C neighborhoods are usually working people. 
And that's, you know, the D neighborhoods are the, the, a lot of neighborhoods where people work, they might be 30 years old making minimum wage, slinging them out somewhere. You know, there's not a lot of upward mobility. Uh, they can't go any lower. The E neighborhoods are all boarded up. So the D is like the last place that people are going to stop before they're living in the street. The C's are pretty stable when the market's going up. This, you know, the people from the D's might be moving into the C's. Uh, when the market goes down, the people in the A's and B's are going down towards the C's. And what happens, and what I've seen in the past, is that in those in the higher end neighborhoods, the rents go down, puts more pressure on the C, and my rents go up. It happened during the last recession. Mm -hmm. My rents continue to rise. It's still happening now where I just had a discussion with a friend in the Baltimore area where his rents are going down in the A neighborhoods and my rents are going up. I just placed a tenant in one of my one bedroom units. I'm getting the highest rent that I ever got for a one bedroom apartment. And it's, it's with a government program, but it's, it's not section eight. There's a lot of other programs out there, but my rents are going up. They're continuing to go up and it'll continue to do so. Interesting. That's a long answer. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's, that's a fascinating answer though, because we're always trying to, um, you know, to read where the economy is going and adjust our strategy accordingly. Um, and I, I think you're definitely right. I don't like to buy class A properties because this is where the, the, these are the first ones that are going to feel, feel the, um, the con, the recession once it, it gets yep. there. So that's why I like to stay within the B and C areas, uh, which I feel are more, recession resistant i don't know recession proof but recession you know recession yeah. resistant for sure yeah, um, I, well great I like the B too. and there's one other thing i'd like to add that that i think is mm -hmm. a really important point is this is something that i caution people against because we're all we can all do this I'm, i've probably been guilty of it for things in the past that are similar to this like you can be very successful in one area like you can be very successful in residential rental and then as a result of your success you get a little too comfortable and a little too overconfident and you think, man, I really got this real estate thing figured out. And then you, you know, start buying warehouses, commercial space, industrial space. You don't know a damn thing about any of those industries. You were very successful in the commercial niche, but that doesn't mean that that same philosophy and strategies and all translate to these other niches. So I've always avoided all of those other things that I've seen friends that do it where, you know, and I did it in the stock market. You think you're doing great, you get cocky, and you, you know, well, the market's going up. Of course, you're going to make money. A monkey makes money when the market's going up. The thing that determines whether or not you really know what you're doing is can you continue that when the market goes down? And when the market goes down, you see what happens with the residential, the industrial, the commercial. You know, those things are the first things to go empty. And uh, people always need a place to live. So I just would caution people against being overly optimistic or overconfident because they're good in one niche. It's not necessarily going to translate to other niches. Yeah, absolutely. I cannot agree more. Absolutely. That's why I focus on a certain, you know, multifamily and that's what I do. If I want to diversify, I invest passively, but I'm not actively looking, you know, for other types of asset classes because I don't know much about other asset classes. I know how to do multifamily. That's what I do best. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do office buildings. I don't know how to do, even Airbnbs, it's it's a different you know it's a different animal. So definitely agree with your with your perspective there. Um, and and I want to transition, you know, and talk a little bit about your strategy. You mentioned earlier that uh, in terms of a strategy, uh, you 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 don't work a lot. You work a few hours a day because you built the you know your company your portfolio in that way. Um, what's, you know, and, and a lot of people I think want to get to that point, but they're also caught up in all the minutia of, you know, doing everything. But before we move to the process of how you do it, I would mm -hmm. love to hear about your strategy of, you know, how, how do you, um, build a portfolio or a company that are set to allow you more free time versus doing everything? Yeah, I can only answer those quite because the, it's the same answer to both questions. Like how do you scale and how do you manage the minutia and how do you get your schedule down to just working the minimal amount? It's, it's kind of the same thing. So I, I'd like to answer that all at the same time. Uh, what I've done when I, when I, when I put this into place, like this, it wasn't my ultimate goal. You know, I just, it just happened like that. And, but the way that it happened for me is something that you can reproduce yourself. And it kind of worked like this. Like, I'm just going to be like honest, like I'm kind of lazy and I, you know, like, I'd rather not do a lot of stuff. And so what I did was when things came up that I don't want to do, 
I've found a way to either automate it or delegate it. And a great example is I include all the utilities with about 50 of my units. Well, I can write the check every month to the gas and electric company in, in my community. I could write 50 checks every month or I could set it up for auto pay. I set them all up for auto pay. The, uh, and I put it on budget billing, so it's about the same amount every month. So I don't have real high bills in the summer and winter and low bills in the spring and fall. I just put it on you know, budget billing so it pretty much stays the same throughout the year. Uh, all on auto pay. I do the same thing with everything that I can possibly do. I put it on auto pay. I've got one building where I pay for oil. Instead of writing five or six checks during the cold months to pay for the oil, I, I put it so I'm just paying per month, even in the summer. I'm just paying the same amount every month and it's all automatically done. Um, there are little things that you can do that I've done, and all my tenants have my personal phone number, every single one of them. So what happens is a tenant calls me up, and let's just say, for example, they call me up and say, hey, Mark, the, uh, you know, my stove isn't working. I had it happen this morning, and uh, I was able to talk to the guy, and within a minute, we fixed it. It was the GFI button where the stove was plugged in, popped out, he had to push it back in, and now the stove works. But let's say it wasn't that simple. Let's just say, you know, really the top parts work and the bottom part isn't. What I do is I give them the number to the appliance repair company, tell them to call the appliance repair company, schedule it, all that. And then the appliance repair company automatically bills me. So I don't have to communicate with them at all because this is what happened and it's maybe happened with you. Tenant calls you. Okay, your stove's not working. I'll call you back in a minute. Hey, stove repair company. Uh, the stove at Gwynn's Falls is broke. Thursday at one, or I'll call you back. He said he can be there Thursday. Oh, you're not going to be there Thursday. Friday's better. Or I'll call you. And you get through all that crap. Same thing with pest control, appliance repairs. You know, if the furnace isn't working, whatever the issue is, most of the time I'll give the tenant the phone number and then let them deal with it. And all the vendors I work with, I trust them 100%. So I know, you know, they've got my debit card information and all that. They're going to bill me for what they did. And that was it. And it just frees me up. And, uh, so that's pretty much how I've run my business. And, I'm, and I also, I have five guys that work for me full time. So if I have a turnover, you know, I use standard paint colors. I use the same carpet. I have a different carpet person, but I use the same carpet, same paint, same cabinets. Everything's the same. So if my guys are doing a turnover, somebody moves out and they got to, you know, fix a couple holes in the walls, paint the apartment, replace some carpet, or, you know, replace a kitchen cabinet. Like they go to Home Depot, they buy everything. They go to the pro desk. I get a phone call. I give them the last four digits of my credit card and the, and the expiration date and it's paid for. I've, I've turned over most of my units and houses the last 10 years and I've never even seen them. Like the, my guys go there, they make a list, they fix it. It's done. We've got tenant placement people that'll fill units for me that are vacant. I've had turnovers where people move out, they're fixed up. I get another tenant in there and I haven't even seen the house mm, because I, I, I get other people to do everything. And, and most of my business I can run, I can run from out of the country. As long as I have access to my laptop and a cell phone, I can run most of my business from anywhere on the planet. That's how you have time to, uh, to fly airplanes and to dive. Yeah, it is. It is. And, uh, and other stuff like this. Like, I love doing this. If, if we can have this conversation for 20 or 30 minutes, I might have the ability to help people that I'll never know. You know, but there, there could be some 15 year old kid, you know, his dad or mom's listening to this podcast and the 15 year old kid hears it and says, wow, you can do that. And it, you can change people's lives that you'll never meet. And it's like, man, what better way to spend my afternoon than that? Yeah, this is the most powerful thing, actually changing people's minds, because what's so clear to us wasn't that clear when we were, you know, doing our you know, going to the office from nine to five. And, and you know, we both have that in common. We have a very cushy job. In, in tech, there is no real reason to look for, a, you know, an alternative besides the fact that we felt that something, that this is not it, that something has, to, there has to be something more secure, maybe bigger, maybe with more, you know, control over, you know, your destiny, whatever it is. So we got out of that rat race. And I think most people are still there and, and they still will be there because they just don't know. So before I started looking into real estate, I thought that I had to be, you know, a millionaire to buy, start buying homes and, and, you know, and start mm -hmm. buying apartment buildings, single family homes, whatever it is. And you learn how to do it. There's a way to do it. And you don't necessarily have to have that much money, but you need to know what you're doing. I, I agree with you a hundred percent on everything you just said. I mean, it's like, 
and the truth is that people today have access to resources that I couldn't even imagine when I started. I mean, you can, you can learn how to wholesale. You can watch YouTube videos and get the basics down. You can learn about the Burr method. You, know, you can watch podcasts and actually hear from people that are really doing it. Like I didn't meet any other landlords for like the first two years I was doing it. I didn't even know anybody that owned any rental properties. Mm -hmm. And people today, it's like they just have access to so much information, so much valuable information and the ability to interact with people like us that they wouldn't meet otherwise and, and learn from us. So that's just people today are really fortunate to, to have, you know, so many tools and resources available to them. There's no excuse now. There's no excuse. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's like you've got everything. You don't need money. You know, there's a Burr method. There are partners. There are, you know, there are so many ways to do it. You know, you don't need it. I think a good real estate agent is like invaluable, but you don't even need to have a real estate agent. I mean, because you can get on Google and find all the wholesale deals. I mean, it's just, you know, there's just so much opportunity out there for all of us. Exactly. For all of us. Exactly. And, and you mentioned a few times the Burr method. Can you talk a little bit about it for those who don't know what, what the Burr method is? Man, if you don't know what the Burr method is, maybe I shouldn't tell them. We should keep that a secret. <laughs> Well, I think bigger pockets were the ones that created that, they that did, phrase, you know, I think. I, I actually invented the Burr method. Uh, at least I thought I did. Here's what it means. <laughs> I'm going to go back in time. Uh, I was doing retail rehabs. You know, I'm, I'm using hard money for the retail rehabs. I'm finding a house and I'm going to use simple numbers. The house is worth a hundred thousand fixed up. 70% of a hundred thousand is 70,000 minus repair costs, maybe you're going to put 20,000 in it. So 70% of a hundred thousand is 70 minus 20 is 50. That's the most you should pay for the property. So you get a property under contract for 50, you sell it for, you put 20 in it, you're in it for 70 plus your holding costs and transaction costs, maybe 75 to 80. You sell it for a hundred, you make $15,000 on the rehab. Very simple. That's the way rehabbers do it. And then I thought to myself, well, and this was like 2005, I, I bought a 15 unit building like this. I thought, what if instead of selling the property, I just refinanced the property and just kept it? Then I could do this with like nothing out of pocket. And I'd, I'd done a couple of retail flips using the 70% rule. And then I used that rule, I bought a 15 unit building, it was eight apartments that were vacant with seven commercial spaces uh, that were rented. And I don't like commercial, but it was such a good deal. It was like, it was actually the first commercial stuff I ever bought. And uh, I borrowed hard money. So the, the burr is buy using somebody else's money, like hard money. Renovate, which is where you get your equity. After it's renovated, you rent it out. So you got some income. Then you refinance it. Now, if you got enough equity during the renovation, when the property is appraised, you should be at, you know, you should have at least 20 to 30% equity. And if you're able to do that, then you're able to refinance out, pay your hard money lender back. They gave you the money for the purchase and the renovation and maybe get enough money back that covers all of your holding costs and transaction costs. And, and theoretically wind up owning a building with nothing out of your pocket and having 20 to 30% equity in the after repair value. So it's just an amazing, an amazing tool, which I've used, man, I can't even list them all of it. I bought a 15 unit like that. I bought a seven unit, a 13 unit, a 14 unit, a 10 unit, a 15 unit, an 18 unit, and probably 25 houses using that method with very wow. little. Pocket. Wow. Yeah, that that's fascinating. Um, and, and, you know, you mentioned that you're actually using hard money to do it. Um, yep. Can you talk a little bit about how this whole thing works and why hard money and not just go to the bank and get a loan so you can finance, you know, your, your next investment? Okay. So the first part I want to mention is like, you don't want to use your own money because even if you've got the half million dollars in the bank, if you start putting 20% down and all that, you're going to run out of money. You know, you're going to do five, 10, 20 projects and now you're broke. If you use banks, man, banks are a little cheaper, but there's nothing that's more of a pain in the ass than working with banks. Uh, they're going to wait to the last minute and they're going to tell you, Oh, well, we need this doc and we need this. Oh, we forgot to tell you, we need a phase one environmental closing is going to be delayed another week. It's like nobody is, is more difficult to work with or takes more fun out of this game than the banks do. The hard money lenders usually are people that know this business inside and out really well. They know the streets, the neighborhoods, the rents, the repair costs, 
there, you know, it's just, it's just so much easier. Is it more expensive? Mm -hmm. Yes. But I would rather get easy where I can build these relationships where it got to the point with hard money where I was able to stand out in front of it. I remember the time this happened, I, I'd used a hard money lender for several jobs and I was always showing up. He was an attorney and I always went to his office on the first of the month and handed him his check. I never mailed it. I showed up and gave it to him because I wanted to establish a relationship with him. I wanted him to know who I am. So if he sees me at Home Depot or a baseball game, he knows me. And by establishing that relationship, I remember sitting out in front of uh, a 13 unit apartment building that I still own. And this was maybe 12 or 13 years ago. And I called him up and I said, Hey Jim, I'm looking at this building on York roads, 13 apartments, half of them are vacant. It's a steal. It's listed for 325. I'm going to need like 75 for the renovation. So I need to borrow $400,000. What do you need from me? Like, what kind of information do you need to, you know, to look at this deal and consider, you know, let me know if you would do the loan. So he said, I'll call you back in a couple minutes. So I thought he was in a meeting or busy or something like that. And he called me back five minutes later and he said, you got it. That easy. That's the same face I made. My eyebrows went up. I'm like, really? I mean, I just got a $400,000 loan with a phone call. The guy doesn't know the address, hasn't seen the building. It's based on my reputation. You know, when I called him up and said, hey, Jim, I need a, you know, a draw for this building. I finished the kitchen, the bathroom, and I got all my mechanical rough ends. And the inspector shows up. Everything's done. There's no bullshit. There's no games like, well, you had a cabinet on the way. They got held. It's none of that. It's like every single time the inspector came, I had done exactly what I said. And most of the time, actually more than what I said. I showed up one time with this check every month. And, and by building that trust, you know, that relationship, banks aren't going to do that. Call up a bank and say, I'm looking at this 13 unit building. And by the time, you know, they give you an approval, somebody else already came in and snatched it up. So it's like the opportunity cost, maybe the bank costs less interest wise and stuff like that, but the opportunity cost, all these deals that you could potentially lose because it's going to take you so long to get the approval. Like, well, that, what's that going to cost you? So the hard, money, the yeah. hard money is the way to go, man. You can scale that way. You want to build your relationships that way. You know, you could get a great relationship with a guy at Wells Fargo or a lady at Nations Bank, and you call three months later and they're not working there anymore. And now what are you going to do? You know, so it's just, yeah. and, and the truth is nobody knows less about our business than the people that work in the banks because they think, especially the ones that work in the big banks, as arrogant as they are, they think that the way they do it is the way that everybody does it. And that's not true. They, the way that they do it, they're constrained by these Fannie Freddie rules where you can only buy like 10 houses and all this other stuff. If you don't want to use hard money, go to your local community banks, the smaller banks. They're, they're not portfolio lenders. They keep all their stuff inside. I'm sorry, they are portfolio lenders. They don't, you know, get 10,000 or 1,000 mortgages together and then sell it off to a bond market in New York. Like they keep their loans in-house and they usually have a lot more flexibility. You can do stuff in LLCs. You can put three houses on one note. You can put five houses in an LLC and put those on the same mortgage. Like they have so much more flexibility. So if you don't want to use hard money for whatever reason, go to the community banks and avoid the big banks as much as you can. Excellent. Excellent advice. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Mark. So we have arrived to the lightning round questions. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you don't sound too uh, excited about them. Because I don't know what the questions are. I'm going to be oh. honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the first one, I think the first one is an easy one. What's your favorite hobby? Man, my favorite hobby. <sighs> you know, it's always changing. It's like, I mean, I, I do a lot of stuff. I, I do a lot of things and I probably travel. If I had to say one thing, and it's not the kind of traveling people think, you know, I mean, I do like sitting underneath the palm tree, you know, on the beach doing nothing. I do like that. But I also really like driving around in the middle of America, in the middle of nowhere, and, you know, staying at a Best Western on the outside of a town and going in to the small town and having dinner where the locals were at. Like, I really like that. You know, it's like I grew up in Baltimore City. So when I go to a small town in Kansas and go get dinner and I'm sitting in a restaurant, there's people wearing cowboy hats. Like, that's like really weird for me. That's like, I feel like I'm on a Western or something. Like, is this real? But, you know, it's just, so to me, it's just fascinating that we have so much, our country, we have so much as far as culture goes. You know I mean? Yeah, and you can name the cities, Louisiana, Boston, the middle of nowhere in Kansas, 
San Diego, Seattle. I mean, we just have, and the cultures of all these are so different and it's just, you know, I just, I love it. So I I have a lot of things, but that's one of my favorite things. So traveling and exploring America. That's nice. That's nice. So uh, what's the one thing that people don't know about you? Man, I'm an open book. Uh, The one thing that people don't know about me. Uh, and I'm going to keep it upbeat. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I, when I, when I was in my 12 to 25 years old, I, I went through a phase, let me put it like that. So I went through a phase where I wasn't doing real well and, uh, I never probably made more than six or $7 an hour. And I was, you know, into the party lifestyle and, you know, and that, you know, that, you learn a lot from that, a lot of good and bad. And that's probably, if there's one thing most people probably don't know about me, it's that part of my past that I'm starting to come out with now because, you know, I've been successful long enough where people aren't going to, you know, judge Hold it against you. Me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's probably it. All right. Um, what do you wish you had known when you just started out? Other landlords. It would have shortened the learning curve so much because I had to figure out everything on my own. And uh, I think that the the value of like networking with other like-minded people uh, and especially people that have gone further than you that can like reach down and give you a hand up as opposed to like friends and family that want to reach up and pull you down, you know, because they don't understand the rentals or, I mean, it happens, you know, we, you know, my uncle bought some rentals and he lost a shirt, you know, it's like, we, that's all we hear, you know, when you're first starting out and then when they see that you've got 20 houses and you're doing good, then they call you lucky. And it's like, son of a... (laughs) (laughs) it's like you didn't say i was lucky when i was working 70 hours a week you know but now you know and that's what happened you know when i first started i was my own mother had a conversation with me one day where she said that uh man you gotta stop working so much you're gonna ruin your family you're gonna ruin your health i'm not a workaholic but i just had a goal and i was like listen i you know and i'm just thinking like i don't know how this whole thing is going to pan out but i know that right now i need to put a lot of effort into this and that's what I did. And, uh, you know, my son says it better than anybody. He said that, uh, I was never home. And then one day I was always home and, uh, you know, cause you know, I built my business up and, uh, so th- those are all important things. We all follow a different path, but if I had one thing that was a question, it would probably be to, if I would like to have known other people that were, that were doing the same thing. So I, it could shorten my learning curve. Interesting. And and speaking about shortening your, your learning curve, uh, what's your number one advice for investors who, you know, uh, want to scale their business? The number one advice to scaling your business that there's a lot of answers to that, but I'd say the number one thing is to, th- these are tied network, go to meetups, go to RIA meetings, network as much as you can. And equally as important is maintain a, an impeccable reputation always, you always want to do the right thing. It's always the right thing to do the right thing. Even if it costs you a friend or costs you money or whatever, like just do that. Because when people know that they can count on you, then they're going to want to work with you and they're going to want to bring you deals. And that's, that's one thing I know I could lose everything I have tomorrow and I could get it back in less than half the period of time because of the people that I know and the reputation that I have. So those two things are, are equally important in this business. Interesting. Um, and then lastly, Mark, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? Uh, markowens.com is my website. My email is mark at markowens.com. That's Mark with a K. Facebook, Mark Owens, REI. Instagram, Mark Owens, REI. I just, had a, I just hired a social media person to help me with this stuff because I've got like one name for one thing and another name for another thing. And she's like, man, this is like dumb. Like you got to have the same name. You got to be consistent. You got to have a, I got a headshot picture and it was like, I didn't do that. I mean, my Facebook might have a picture of my dog, (laughs) you know, know, it's just like all this stuff. And, and she's, you know, like you got to grow up old man and, you know, like, and make a little bit more of a consistent, uh, social media presence. So now it's Mark Owens, REI. You type that in in Google and you'll probably find me somewhere. All right. Perfect. Well, that's why you hire a team or, you know, people that can help you scale. That's part of it. Cause you, you don't necessarily need to be good at everything. And even if you were, you know, a social media master, you don't have time to do it. You need no, to find I, the next deal. 
Well, you said it. You're, I mean, listen, you said it the best. It's like you don't need to learn all this stuff. You know, it's like you've, I, my strength is one in finding the deal, and I work very well with my tenants. I, I've, I'm very skilled at that. Uh, I don't want to have to learn a whole new, like, how to do search engine optimization or build your Instagram brand. Like, I don't want to start a career. It's like I want to hire somebody else to help augment the career that I already have. And I think that's exactly, I think you gave really good advice. Well, thank you. Well, I, you know, I really want to, you know, thank you for spending time with me and educating, you know, me and my listeners um, about, you know, investing in Silicon family homes and the Burr method and hard money lending. So definitely a lot of good content here. And I, you know, I know that this is probably, we talk about uh, 40 minutes out of your two hours that you're, that you're dedicating uh, to work this every day. Uh, this is, I love doing this. I, I could go, <laughs> I could get two hours just doing this. If, if I think that we have the opportunity to help people, you know, why wouldn't I? All right. All right. Well, perfect. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you again. Hey, thank you, Ellie. And I hope you have a great day. And thanks again for inviting me on here. And I, you know, hopefully we can provide some value information to your listeners.